All right. So we're going to start out at the uh, vehicle selection page. First section we're going to look at here is going to be the vehicle selection in the top left or create a new vehicle as it's uh, labeled here. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background about myself, I guess, before I launch in here. Um, so I spent five years working for Identifix. I did training, support, uh, diagnostic hotline calls, kind of pretty much a lot of different stuff for the company. And uh, so I actually used to train shops when they would sign up for the product. And uh, I felt that, you know, they, they dissolved their training division um, after I, well, actually, while I was still working there, I don't work for them anymore. Um, but I felt that it's a program that people can really benefit from some additional training on. Uh, you get a lot more value out of it if you have a little bit of a chance to go through some of the different stuff and uh, get familiarized with how it works and some of the kind of unique features of it. Um, it is very different from all data and Mitchell in certain respects. Um, you know, it has some advantages and some disadvantages kind of depending on how you use it. Um, obviously, we'll try to give you the best ways to use it uh, to make it most effective so you can be efficient. Um, the training is mostly geared towards a technician, but uh, depending on, you know, if you have a service advisor or somebody else who uh, has to use it to look up things or maybe helps the technicians out by printing out repair procedures, um, this training could certainly be beneficial for them as well. So um, the recording will definitely get saved and I'll share it to everybody. So, you know, if you got additional people you want to have watch it at home or, you know, maybe on lunch period or whatever, um, certainly would be feasible to do that. So uh, happy to do that. So my background, you know, I've been in the automotive field for about 20 years, uh, done a lot of different jobs. I've actually done most of the jobs except for owning a shop. Um, I've managed shops. I've been a technician. Uh, I worked for Identifix for five years. Now I do uh, technical support and training. And uh, yeah, so I've, I've kind of been around the field uh, most of my life and I uh, really enjoy being in the field, and uh, I'm really interested in trying to help people do better, uh, try to help people when I can with diagnostic questions or, you know, solving a problem. Um, I really enjoy the process of diagnostics, so any way that I can help, I always try to do that. And my current job is very flexible in how I work, uh, so I have time to jump on Facebook and comment and assist whenever I can, and I like doing that because ultimately the the diagnostic process is kind of nerding out for me. So <laughs> really like doing that. And so, uh, you know, you'll probably see me on a lot of the different groups commenting and trying to assist uh, in any way that I can. So uh, feel free to reach out if you do run into one where you have a question and uh, maybe I can help. I don't know if I'll be able to or not, but uh, certainly more than happy to do that if I possibly can. Oh, <laughs> talking about the Pico scope. Yes, uh, I did just buy a Pico scope, uh, the newest model. Uh, absolutely love it. It's been a fantastic tool. I've used it a bunch of times to help a number of shops uh, in the course of my normal day. And uh, it's really, really made a difference in uh, my ability to diagnose cars and give shops clear answers as to what's going on with the vehicle. Um, I think it's really helping show the value of a scope to a lot of shops as well, who maybe, you know, a lot of them have a Zeus. So many shops are sold the Zeus and really don't take advantage of the, the fact that it does have a scope. Um, I'm not personally a huge fan of that tool because I think it's a tremendous price for what you really get. Um, but, you know, that being said, if you've already purchased it, uh, you dang well better use everything that it can do because holy cow, that's a massive investment. So um, I've definitely run across a lot of shops that have that and I've been encouraging them to see the value in what a scope can do. And really just being able to give a visual representation of what's broken with a car which I think makes it easier to sell the job to the customer sometimes. So um, certainly some of the shops out there now are taking advantage of digital inspections and things of that nature, which I think, uh, you know, that really makes the communication to the customer easier, um, being able to really get that information across in a way that, you know, the customer may not understand what they're looking at, but if you show them here's what good looks like and here's what bad looks like, you know, they can usually look at a visual representation and understand, okay, that doesn't match this. Um, so that's helpful. So we'll go into the training now. Um, looking at the vehicle selections up in the top left, basically you have two ways to select a vehicle. You've got the vehicle VIN search, which is right here, or you have the vehicle selection. Um, the vehicle VIN search, I like to remind people, it's really critical to keep in mind that this the only thing that this is really going to do for you is nail down which engine the vehicle has. It also does not pre-filter any of the content itself. 
uh, for the given vehicle as far as the OEM service information. So Identifix authors and writes articles themselves from hotline calls that they take uh, on vehicles. And those articles do get filtered by the VIN, mostly just based on the powertrain. But the OEM service information, so take, for example, a Volkswagen. Uh, many Volkswagens have three, four, five different possible engines. All of that service manual content will be displayed at all times, regardless of which service or uh, submodel vehicle you select. So the VIN doesn't help you in terms of narrowing down that information. So I, I like to highlight that because I think that's a thing that trips up some shops sometimes and uh, can cause some headaches. So you want to be careful with that. I personally use the vehicle selection manual mode most often myself. Um, you know, you can go through the drop down and basically select your make and model. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the drop down as well as the VIN search supports more content than there is actually on the website. So just because you can enter the vehicle doesn't mean that they're going to have any information available for it. Um, you know, there's a lot of vehicles like Isuzu NPR where they might have some hotline archives, but they're not going to usually have any service info on the website. Now, that being said, they do have some information that's not always on the website that you can request, which I will definitely show you how to do. Um, that is a free service that they offer as well um, as part of your subscription. So uh, the second feature that I like to go over at the main screen here is the recent vehicle search down in the bottom left here. So this is a really tremendous tool that can help you save a lot of time. You know, a lot of shops have one or two different logins, or maybe you have a bunch of different logins. Um, it's important to keep in mind that this vehicle list is limited to whichever login you're using. So if you have five usernames, whatever username you're using, that's where all those vehicles will be stored under. They will not synchronize across all of the usernames you have for your account. So that's uh, it's crucial. You want to stick to the same username when you're doing operations. Um, the previous vehicle search, obviously, they kind of have a recent vehicle list here, which is just a quick hits. And they do have a little key down at the bottom here that shows some uh, various things that tells you if you have bookmarks, which is a huge thing we're going to cover. Uh, hotline reference. So if you contacted the hotline and received diagnostic assistance on a given vehicle, uh, it'll have a little icon next to it. And then has estimate. So there is an estimating tool that is built into the program, just a lightweight, quick estimate kind of thing uh, that you can use for, you know, quick quotes or things of that nature. And then it'll show, it'll highlight that next to the vehicle as well. So on the previous vehicle search, this actually gives you a, a greater deal of control over which results and also how far back you're actually looking. So here you can manipulate the year, the make, the model. You can even put in the date in which you pulled that vehicle up. So if you worked on the vehicle a month ago and now the customer comes back and you're going to work on it again, you can actually search out that specific vehicle and find it just by manipulating the dates. Uh, you can also check the boxes for the other possible criteria here, which again, just helps you narrow your results further. So really good tool. Important to keep that in mind just for future reference. Really can help you out quite a bit. Um, top right here is just open fixes. So if you look at a hotline archive, they will put these up here and ask, you know, did you fix the car based on one of the articles you looked at? Um, if so, you know, what was the ultimate fix? So you can definitely uh, enter those in. Uh, it does help them improve the content for both yourself as well as other shops. So, you know, if you have two seconds to do it, by all means, please do. It always makes it better. Um, you can also look at any fixes that you have submitted right here under the My Shop Fixes. So, we're going to go ahead and just select a vehicle. I'm going to go into a vehicle that I actually looked at myself uh, not that long ago, which was a 2011 Hyundai Sonata. And you're going to see right here, it's in my recent vehicle list. And it does have a bookmark, which I have saved. And I will definitely show you folks how to use the bookmark section. It is extremely helpful and saves you a ton of time. So we're going to click on that vehicle just for jumping back in. So the first thing I like to go over when you get into the main screen here is the search box. The search box is both powerful, but also dangerous. Uh, there's great features to it, but it can really give you more information than you want or need. Uh, it can be overwhelming as far as what results it gives you, but you have some additional tools that will help you narrow down what the search box will actually provide. So you can put anything in this box, whether it's you have a name of a specific component, you have a code, you have a symptom, whatever it might be, 
that's pretty wide as far as what you can enter in and what results you'll get. It's important to keep in mind that vehicle manufacturers do use different terminology for components across the brands. So, you know, some manufacturers might call it a generator, some might call it an alternator. If it's a really common term like that, you can expect that the search engine has been modified to take that into account. So it will find generator if you search alternator. Um, but there are situations where there's specific language used by a vehicle manufacturer that has not been accounted for by their search box. Um, they are always trying to improve it, and they've certainly made it better over the years. Um, when I worked there, there was a number of times where the development folks came to us, the technicians, and asked us, you know, are there additional words or terminology that we should build in equivalencies to? And we, we have continuously done that, um, you know, throughout the course when I worked there. So I'm sure they're still doing that now. I have many friends who still work there, and they've definitely said that, yeah, they're always trying to refine it and make it better. Um, you do see that there are top searches. Those are just common searches that get searched out on this particular vehicle. Um, those can change over time. But what I like to use in the search box, the service manuals only box right here, if you check that and you want to look at just vehicle manufacturer specific published data, so whether that's a repair procedure, a wiring diagram, description and operation, anything of that nature coming directly from the vehicle manufacturer, the service manuals only button is what you want to check off. And then that's going to limit your content to only OEM information. That'll exclude all of the hotline archives and every other type of content. It's just going to ignore that stuff and only search there. Um, so depending on what you're looking for, that can be helpful. Now, the other thing you're going to see here is the search box defaults to a models with same engine package. This is really crucial to keep in mind when you go to search out something like, okay, I'm working on a problem that's powertrain specific. Okay, well, the default search is definitely what you want then, models with the same engine package. Well, we want vehicles with the same powertrain if it's a powertrain issue. Now, if it's not a powertrain issue, let's say it's an ABS issue, it's important to look at, you can change it to all available engine packages or all available engine packages plus minus two years. So the ABS system is very likely going to function the same regardless of whether it has the 2.0 or the 2.4 in this particular circumstance. Now, you always want to double check that to make sure but the odds are very likely it's a similar operation or the same operation. So if you're looking for something chassis related, then it's good to make a change to this search box, uh, basic criteria. Now there's also this system symptom search box. You click on that and it brings up this box you'll see here. This allows you to manipulate what kind of content you're going to pull when you perform your search. So again, we have the drop down here to change, you know, whether or not we're thinking about something powertrain or chassis side. And then we have all of this information here. Now, the one thing I would caution you about on this is don't, I would not recommend unchecking many boxes because how information gets categorized sometimes does not line up with what you would expect. So a good example would be maybe you're expecting description and operation information. Sometimes that information might be under something related to a DTC, or it could be under something under description and operation. So the search, it's all dependent on where the vehicle manufacturer puts the information. So again, how the vehicle manufacturer categorizes can affect what these boxes are going to do to the data that you physically pull off of the website. So important to keep that in mind. I don't generally manipulate or screw around with these unless I'm going for something really specific and I'm pretty confident I know right where it's going to be. Um, Obviously, if you just want to look at something specific like a wiring diagram or whatnot, then it makes maybe a little more sense to play with these. But it's just another tool. I'd say, you know, if you, I always just use the search box raw straight out of the gate. Uh, if I get too many results or I really want to filter things down, then I play around with this or the drop down. So just keep that in mind. Just another tool that might help you out and speed things up a little bit. So now we'll go down to the bottom left, which is the quick hits section. So this is a great little shortcut, if you will, that can get you to a lot of really quick information. So if you're doing a basic service on a vehicle, you know, you're doing fluids changing, oil change, tire rotation, whatever it might be, really simple, quick stuff like that. This is the place to go for sure. So they have additional uh, information on here from Motor, which uh, Motor is just a data uh, provider that gives basic data on vehicles. Um, usually things, real basic service things like exactly what we're talking about here. 
So uh, the motor specification section, you can go there, click on that, and it'll take you right into the motor stuff. So motor has a wide variety of things, but you know they're usually going to have things like fluid capacities and sometimes some shortcuts about where you're going to physically fill the fluid and whatnot. Um, I like that. I think it's a great shortcut. Personally, for me, I typically try to go to the OE information. Uh, so you can see we do have a tab here that's labeled OEM specifications and capacities. Now that data is going to pull directly from the vehicle manufacturer's service manual. So very important to keep that in mind. So there's additional other uh, things under this section here. Fixed data. So that's going to take you to things like uh, OEM TSBs, uh, drive cycle. Now that's one that a lot of folks ask about when they're searching the website. Um, there's a couple of different key phrases I've used over time to find those procedures. You can usually search drive cycle in the search box. Uh, readiness is another word that's a really good one that'll find it a lot. Um, now again, remember how to spell that. I'll type it out here. So searching readiness is a really good way to find it as well. But if you're trying to figure out what the drive cycle is, those are the two phrases that I've found typically will find exactly what you're looking for. Um, again, it's going to vary by vehicle manufacturer. So that's the most important thing to keep in mind when you're using identifixes. Number one, what type of content is available is all determined by the vehicle manufacturer as far as, you know, service specifications, repair procedures, et cetera, things like that. Um, so that's, you know, and I think that trips some people up from time to time, just because, you know, one manufacturer may give you a really good in-depth description and operation of how the evaporative system works. Another manufacturer, like Volkswagen or Audi, for instance, uh, they publish that kind of information in a separate document called a self-study program, which is not going to be found in their normal service manual or on Identifix. Now, the good news is you can still request that type of information. Uh, and again, we're going to show you how to do that, which will definitely help you out in situations. Uh, so you see there's some other links here, hotline archives. Now, those automatically are going to pull up if you search in the search box, so you don't have to really worry about that. Uh, repair info, this is just a pre-filtering of other types of content that are available. Um, now, you'll notice there are some additional options for wiring diagrams. Um, personally, I strongly recommend sticking with the OEM wiring diagrams, or at a minimum, if you're dealing with a wiring-related issue on a vehicle, if you like the color wiring diagrams, which are kind of the simplified, uh, Bosch provides them to Identifix, I believe, but the simplified wiring diagrams, you know, they kind of redraw the diagram in a universal format, similar to the ones you'd find on Mitchell. Um, I think all data has them as well. The biggest thing to worry about with those diagrams is there's more and more vehicles now that actually have multiple versions of wiring possible. So they might have three or four different levels of equipment or two or three different engine packages. And especially when you get into the Euro world, there's a lot of build date splits. There's sometimes production code differences. So if it has production code OE5 or whatever it might be versus a different one, the wiring diagram can complete can be completely different. Now, I have personally experienced that when you go into the color wiring diagrams, they frequently only display one version of the wiring for a given system, which again, as I just explained, that is not the case on the vehicle in a lot of situations. So you want to be cautious with this. If you go to the color wiring diagram, print it out, but then go over to the OEM wiring diagram and verify that that diagram is drawn correctly because otherwise you could end up chasing your tail for a lot of time thinking that you've got the right wiring diagram when you do not. Um, motor. Motor is typically a recycled version of the OEM. They oftentimes just have the OEM diagrams in like a black and white version or a less nice looking version. But again, it's typically OEM. It's not always, but usually it is. Um, I frankly see, I think they're fairly redundant personally. But there's uh, also component locations, links here and such, which can be very helpful. Now, you're probably wondering, okay, what are the other sections we've got here? So we have the estimating in the center. Um, estimating is basically just for looking up labor or making a quick quote. Um, you'll see there's some hot links here, Chilton Labor. Chilton Labor is a guide that a lot of people like. Uh, it's usually only available on vehicles mid-2010-ish era and older. Uh, they stopped making Chilton Labor guides. Uh, in that general vicinity, so you won't really see them anymore. Um, motor parts and labor and direct estimate both pull from motor, uh, so those are both motor labor guides, basically. Um, there are some additional tabs. You'll see recalls that you can look at over here, too. 
Now, I don't personally understand why that's in the estimating tab, but go figure. <laughs> uh, direct estimate is basically just a quick estimating tool. So you can go in here to create a quick quote for a customer. Uh, if you literally just want to look up labor real fast, there's a lot of stuff you can do with it. I personally don't find that it's all that useful for the most part, other than for looking up labor. Um, it's not meant to be a full invoicing system. So, you know, you can't really run your shop through this. You can't really do full in-depth invoicing. If you just want to write someone a quote over the phone or something of that nature, sure, it works fine for that. Um, you can certainly enter in all the customer data in here if you want, and that'll all get tied to the specific vehicle you looked up. And again, remember that vehicle is tied specifically to whatever login you used. So if it's your service advisor, it's going to be on their login, not on yours as the technician if you have a different username and password. Um, so just keep that in mind. Maintenance. Maintenance is just another tab you can access. Now you'll notice these are actually recycled and redundant from the top up here. So maintenance, if you click there, will take you the same place that you'd see here. And then same thing with estimating. If you click on estimating, it's basically just going to display these same three tabs here, direct estimate, motor, and Chilton. Um, but maintenance is another one that people get tripped up on from time to time. It's important to keep in mind that maintenance schedules that are on Identifix come directly from the vehicle manufacturer. They do not come from, uh, for instance, all data writes their own maintenance schedules uh, that are basically, they, they provide time and uh, mileage-based intervals for literally almost everything, and they make those up on their own. Unfortunately, because those do not come from the vehicle manufacturer, number one, if you use those recommendations on all data to recommend to a customer, and the customer goes to another shop that sticks with the OEM, you can get burned because you might be accused of, of recommending something the vehicle doesn't need based on the vehicle manufacturer's recommendations. And if the customer goes to a dealer, you're going to get lit up big time. So I would really recommend against using the maintenance schedules and all data, uh, unless they have the OEM maintenance schedules and you're copying those. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, you know, I think as a general statement, the parallels between all data and Identifix are fairly numerous. They're, they're very similar programs, but there are a few things that you can get burned on there. The other one on all data that you can get burned on is the labor guide. All data does physically change their labor times, uh, especially if they get requests or reports on a given vehicle. Motor and Chilton, on the other hand, do not. So if you're dealing with a fleet company or a warranty company, you're definitely going to want to stick with Motor or Chilton, or you're going to want to be able to make a very compelling case to whoever you're recommending the labor time to, uh, because otherwise you're going to get burned or you're going to get uh, you know a back charge or something to that effect for essentially not following the labor guides that are standard across the in industry. So um, just a couple other things to keep in mind. Now, that being said, lots of times uh, there are labor times that should be changed. So <laughs> it's I always think it's good to check across multiple sources for labor. Many of the shops that I've worked at myself, we had both all data and Identifix, or we had Identifix and Mitchell, or you know some combination of the three. And we almost always check labor times in more than one place because Labor guides are wrong sometimes, and you definitely don't want to get burned that way either. So uh, the far right section here is just service and repair manuals. This is just a shortcut to all of the service information uh, published by the vehicle manufacturer. Now, this is a great kind of a visual cue. If you log in and select a vehicle and you come up empty and you see nothing on this far right section, that's an indication that the service manual is physically missing from the website. So this does happen. Uh, Identifix has struggled to get their content updated on newer vehicles, which is the, the primary knock against them currently. Um, that was a problem when I worked there. It's still a problem now. Um, I know they're definitely trying to make it better, but it's a very slow process, as usually is the case with any large corporate entity. Uh, so if you run into a situation like that where you're missing the service manual over on the far right, go down to the very bottom here, go to the Contact Us section, click on that, now you're going to see there's a bunch of different options. So the repair hotline, this is a redundant link to the link up in the top right here. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that if you click this button and you go for a hotline request, this is requesting to specifically speak with an ASE master technician of a given vehicle brand, uh, which means you are going to be charged for it. So 
Uh, don't just use this for an information request. If you need information that is published by the vehicle manufacturer, or you hope is published by the vehicle manufacturer, you would want to click on this information request form right here. So this goes to the product support people. Now, most of the product support people are not former technicians. Most of them are not like me where, you know, I was a technician and I also did support. So I had much deeper knowledge and understanding of if you sent a request, I would know what you're talking about. A lot of the folks that work on product support do not have that specialist uh, background. So it's very important that when you put in your information here, you're as specific and detailed as possible. Give them everything, spoon feed it to them. Give them, you know, the VIN, tell them exactly what you want. I want a wiring diagram of this and this and this. I need a component location of this and this and this. I need a repair procedure from start to finish with all steps from this to this. Be explicit, be detailed, give them everything you could possibly need. That's going to work out in your favor and you're going to have a much better chance of getting what you want. Um, obviously put in a good valid email address. Do not use faxes. You will never be able to read them. So if for some reason your shop still has a fax machine, please do not use a fax. It will never go well for you. <laughs> Probably don't need to say that too often, but you know there were still some shops that would request us to send them a fax and it was just a total nightmare to try and make that happen. Now, one other thing that you may have noticed, uh, both when we were in the quick hits section uh, down in the bottom left there, there's a tab for IATN. It is important to keep in mind you do have to have a separate IATN subscription in order for any of these links to actually do anything for you. Basically, all these do is take you to IATN, and then you still have to log in, and you still have to do all the same stuff. So a lot of folks are kind of confused, and they think that, oh, well, if I click on this, I automatically get to use IATN. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case. So got to have an active IATN subscription to be able to take advantage of that. So uh, just another detail that's important to keep in mind. So the other thing we're going to go to next will be the OEM content layout. So basically, if you want to look at service manual content for a given vehicle manufacturer, the shortest and quickest way to get to the overall table of contents, if you will, or think about it like it's a giant old school paper manual. Uh, service manuals in the top here, in the top bar. Basically, if you click on that, it takes you right in here. I always click on OEM Direct right here. And then you can see we have a layout of all of the different shop data information that is provided by, in this situation, Hyundai. So... Hyundai splits it up in their own specific methodology. Everybody does it different. You can't count on it to be the same across vehicle manufacturers, which kind of sucks, but it is the reality that we're dealing with. So this is the part where a lot of folks find Identifix harder to deal with than all data, just because Identifix gives it to you exactly as the vehicle manufacturer does. All data filters, screens, modifies, et cetera, and funnels it down into a more universal format, which no doubt can be a lot easier to navigate depending on how you deal with it. However, sometimes in that filtering and uh, narrowing of content that uh, all data does, you may lose some of the content that you would get from the OEM that Identifix will still provide to you. So kind of an important thing to keep in mind. So if we look through the different manuals just in this example, we can see that Hyundai breaks it up into a couple of different manuals. So we have like an OBD2 manual that's talking about drive cycle. We got a shop manual. This is where they're going to talk about larger procedures and description and operation of different systems. So like if we clicked on engine mechanical, there's subsystems. You can look at various things. Okay, what do we got? Cylinder block, components and component locations, repair procedures, etc. Then Hyundai also has a replacement manual. This is where they put in more individualized replacement of specific components. So if you don't find what you're looking for in the shop manual, look in the replace manual. If you don't get all of what you're looking for in the replace manual, you might want to look at the shop manual. So again, varies by vehicle manufacturer, but there's a lot of information. It's just how they arrange it can be a little bit goofy. Now, the other thing I like to remind folks of, especially if you're a technician, use your automotive specific knowledge to logically figure out where that information might be. So if you've got a specific component that you're looking for information on, it's really, really good to think about, okay, what, what system is that particular component likely to be considered a part of? Um, and in doing that, I also like to remind folks, I think it's a really good place to start at the wiring manual. 
Uh, the wiring manual, usually on a lot of Asian cars, they call it the ETM or electronic troubleshooting manual. Um, I think it's really good to start at the wiring manual if it's an electrical component in any way, shape or form, because the electrical troubleshooting manual will give you the specific terminology used by the vehicle manufacturer to identify a component, which will not only help you find it in other places in the manual, as well as fault codes related and other stuff of that nature, but it will also help you understand just how they're looking at the system. So if they draw it, you know, a brake switch is part of the brake system, or maybe they draw it as part of the lighting system. You know, it just depends on how they lay it out. But it can be really helpful to be able to look at that. And even here, now this vehicle was actually a vehicle I was diagnosing a brake switch issue on. So, of course, you know, the first thing I looked for was brake switch or brakes. And, of course, there was nothing. So I scrolled down and, of course, they called it stop lamps. So, again, this is another one of those situations where the vehicle manufacturer just likes to use specific language. Who the hell knows why they chose that versus the other? No idea. You know, it just varies from vehicle manufacturer to vehicle manufacturer. But going into the wiring diagram now, we can get a ton more information. You can figure out even here, look at they're telling you how it operates the switch, which is nice. Um, but again, of course, varies by vehicle manufacturer. Um, but the many of the wiring diagrams are actually physically interactive as well. So you might be able to go to that wiring diagram and get actually access in a kind of a shortcut fashion to a ton more information than you might otherwise expect. So I like wiring diagrams from a lot of manufacturers because they are exactly that, they're interactive. So a lot of the cases you'll see the type is just a little bit different color. So it's, you know, it's blue here. If we click on this, it's actually gonna take us to something additional. So in this case, it gives us a pinout and we know that E18 is the designation for the stop lamp switch. They also describe the connector and they show you all of the different stuff, what's on each pin, which is pretty awesome. You'll also notice at the top left here, there's some additional links to some other stuff. So if we click on component, Hyundai actually shows us where it's located and the connector and whatnot. Now, obviously that's with a lot of stuff disassembled, so <laughs> making it look a little bit easier than it actually is to access, but still helpful. And then the harness, which is another thing I really like about Hyundai, is they actually show you the routing of the harness. So you can see here we've got all of the different connectors are labeled. They show you where everything goes. So this can be tremendously helpful if you're dealing with something like a broken wire and you need to back trace a harness. This is really, really helpful. Now, again, not every manufacturer provides this, but obviously when they do, holy cow, does that really help you out? Now, I'm going to go back to the main section there, click on connector, and it takes us right back. You can also use these arrows in the top right here to navigate back and forth between the various content that you've clicked on. Now, you're also going to notice that I clicked on, you can see it says remove bookmark. So I'm going to remove it. But if I click on it again, let's say I am diagnosing what I was diagnosing on this vehicle, which was a brake lamp uh, or a brake switch issue. Uh, if you bookmark this, now we will go back out of the vehicle here and we'll go to new vehicle here and you can see what this does for us so if we scroll down our vehicle list here see how that hyundai now has that little bookmark symbol next to it now it did before just because i never took the bookmark away but we can see there's a bookmark there now if we go back into the vehicle let's say you were doing a diagnosis on this brake switch and maybe you got all the way through the diagnosis or you got 80% of the way through and the customer said, hey, I'm going to take the car for now, whatever it might be. But you did a bunch of research to figure out, you know, how does the system work? You found all the documentation. You looked up the wiring diagram. You did all that stuff. All the groundwork was done. And now the vehicle comes back a month later and you're like, oh man, I got to go find all that stuff again. No, you don't. If you use the bookmark function, now you can go back, find that vehicle in your vehicle history list click on the bookmarks in the very top right here and look at the stuff that I've been able to save. So I saved an article that was specifically talking about a brake switch issue and the wiring diagrams that I bookmarked are also right here. So this is, for me, this is the gold nugget of everything that you want to remember. Now, this doesn't matter whether you're the service advisor or the technician or somewhere in between doing multiple roles. Being able to save the research that you spent the time invested in doing and access that information immediately without having to do over any of your work. God, just invaluable, absolutely invaluable.
hugely helpful, uh, especially if you're on flat rate. It's even more crucial to have a tool like this where you can just go right back to what you were doing and not have to worry about it. Also tremendously helpful if you guys have, let's say maybe you have one login and you share it between the service advisor and the technician. Now, if that happens, go ahead and hit that contact us, reach out to the folks that support, do that information request form like we did, and just request another login. They will usually let you have, I believe, up to four logins for your account. And uh, that's really helpful so that you don't A, kick each other out of the website, and B, you don't have to constantly go back and find your place again. Now, that being said, if you work in a really big shop and you still only have four logins, you might still get booted out and you might lose your place. So make sure you're taking advantage of that bookmark function because that'll really save you a ton of time and a lot of headaches. And then you won't want to yell at your coworkers. So <laughs> definitely, definitely something to keep in mind there. So now that we covered like the bookmarks and whatnot, we're going to go back to the kind of the bread and butter of Identifix, which most people, you know, it's kind of notorious both in a good way and a bad way. Um, some people kind of knock on Identifix because they feel that people use it as a crutch. Now, if it's used incorrectly, yes, it can be a crutch. Um, however, if it's used correctly, it can be a tremendous asset because there's all this volume of experience that you're tapping through the hotline archives that you would otherwise not have access to. Now, a really good example of that. I was at a shop helping them the other day. They had a draw, a battery draw on a 2014 Nissan Pathfinder. And they had a bunch of codes and they were all related to the AV unit, which is basically the, the radio CD player nav unit all in one. And they said, oh, it's got a battery draw, et cetera. And I've got some codes for this and whatnot. They had not gone on Identifix. They had not looked into it any further. And they had also not placed a hotline call. Now, I have lots of connections still working there. And I happened to talk to one of my friends working there. And I asked him, hey, is this a really common problem? Now, I didn't bother to look it up on Identifix because I was like, well, even if it's not on the website, I know he'll know because he takes calls on these vehicles all day. So he said, yes, it's a really common problem on those vehicles. It's a common failure part. Don't get a used one. It'll probably do the same thing that the other one did. And while it didn't do the exact same thing, it was still defective. So they ended up, we traced it down. We proved out it was the AV unit that was the cause of the draw. The customer said, hey, I don't want to buy a new one. It was like $4,000 or something astronomical. And of course, the shop had already been given a used one by the the used car dealer who had given them the vehicle to diagnose. They put the used one in and then the AV screen would not come on. And so he was like, okay. And, you know, he didn't program it or anything else and verify that it needed programming, which I'm sure it did. Um, so he, you know, he's like, well, I think it might be defective. And I said, well, you know, it's a pattern failure part. But again, that's one of those things where if he had looked on Identifix, there's a good possibility there'd be an archive telling you exactly that hey, this is a pattern failure component. You might not want to use a used one or try a used one. Anyhow, they give you a lot of experiential data you would not otherwise have access to. Now, if you have networking and friends or like if you're in the groups that obviously I posted this uh, this particular training to, you also have that network of people to reach out to. So there's a large volume of technician experience that we can access through our networking that also is beneficial. But Identifix does have a lot of information that is otherwise not available. Um, so it's kind of like, I like to look at the hotline articles, like extended TSVs in a sense, they're not saying you should do this only. They're just giving you some, Hey, here's some information about what might be common, or here's a shortcut to test. Uh, I had an experience with a Subaru that I was not familiar with that had a code. Uh, I can't remember what exactly the code was, but it was related to something to do with the VBT system and the vehicle actually ran like dirt. And, you know, I didn't want to have to read through all the description and operation mumbo jumbo. So I looked up the code and I found an article and it literally told me exactly what to test. I followed the test steps and I figured out exactly what was wrong with the vehicle. I put the switch in that I concluded was defective based on the test steps they provided and it fixed the car. And like it saved me an astronomical amount of time from having to do all the research myself and figure out how everything works and pull up every wiring diagram, blah, blah, all that stuff. So it can be really helpful in those situations as long as you remember it's not giving you an answer. It's simply trying to help you with giving you a faster test plan or giving you some hints about how something operates maybe that is otherwise not explicitly described by the vehicle manufacturer. 
Um, I think that can be even more beneficial when you get into European cars, where the description and operation information is just fundamentally not published, except in very rare cases. Um, so good thing to remember on that front. So we're just going to look up a given article here. Going to type in brake switch because that was one of the articles I had looked up on this vehicle. So you'll see when you get your results back. Now, I just did a general search. It categorizes all the information you get back from the search box. So it gives you, it says, hey, there's a recall. There's something related to drive cycle. Pardon me. I got to let somebody else into the meeting here who jumped in a little late. All right, there we go. So you can see here, we've got all this different information published here. There's wiring diagrams related. There's, you know, any number of different things. There's even potentially some labor time for this particular component. So it's important to keep in mind that each of these are going to just basically jump you down the screen further. So like if I click on any one of these, all it does is scroll down. You can see by the scroll bar over on the far right here, it's not actually taking you to a different page. So it's helpful, but ultimately not really that a big of a deal. If you scroll through, you're going to get all the same stuff. However, one thing I like to point out after you do a search on any of the Hotline archives, we're going to go into a Hotline archive here. Number one, like we talked about with the search box, you want to make really sure that you're searching based off the criteria that makes sense for your vehicle. So if it's powertrain related, totally use the engine package filter. If it's not powertrain related, totally allow it to do more searching because that can help you quite a bit. Uh, expanding the vehicle year can be helpful. But when we get into something like this, we're going to click on that first article. It's really crucial to remember a couple of things. Number one, vehicle application. You need to be extremely careful on this. A lot of shops skip over this section. They just go, hey, it came up in the search, so it must be my vehicle. They don't read the vehicle application, and that can really screw you. Because especially if it's something related to wiring or there might be a, a change in the vehicle operation between a 2010 and a 2011 or a 2011 and a 2012. Even if the engine happens to be the same displacement, it's not going to filter some of that stuff out for you. And if you're getting into something like wiring, there can be a difference between literally one model year to another. Happens all the time. So if they've only tagged it with one model year vehicle, you better be damn sure that the vehicle you're working on is exactly that model year. Or at a bare minimum, you need to go verify Go look up a 2011 if you're working on a 2012, or go work up a 2012 when you're working on a 2011. Verify that that wiring is the same or the fuse is the same. You need to do your research and verify. You can't take it for granted unless your exact vehicle is listed here. Now, that's not to say that the article is maybe not going to be helpful to you because the logic of how the code might be setting or whatever descriptive information they give you may still be valuable or helpful to you. But the, again, the crucial detail being is it's not, you can't go through the test plan and trust it's going to give you the right answer if your specific vehicle isn't listed here. So again, very important to remember. Now, the other thing to remember is the tests and procedures section. This is something that has been written by one of their hotline folks. They're telling you how to test a given component or the proper procedures to determine if something is faulty. If you ever run across one of these and it does not appear to give you a concrete answer, they're not telling you, hey, you know, I, they're not telling me, hey, what's good or what's bad. And you have a question about that. Definitely use that contact us form. Don't place a hotline call. If they have failed to detail something in here that should be part of the description, call them out on it because they do make mistakes. They're human beings just like everybody else. So important to keep that in mind. Now, sometimes I'll also give you the tech tips here. This is usually just a kind of a note about how something might operate or um, you know, some additional insight that might be beneficial. Uh, now, the other thing you'll notice is all the highlighted text. The highlighted text, all that does is cue it to search. So if I click on this, it's literally just searching the website for P0504, which you can also do by going right back to the main page on home. And all it does is search out any information that's published related to that. It's not actually linking to some other database or anything else. It's just basically duplicating what the search box does. So keep that in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is whatever terminology they're using right here may or may not match what the vehicle manufacturer calls a given component. So a great example would be on Volkswagen or Audi. Volkswagen or Audi loves to assign a combination of letters and numbers to identify their components. Now, 
Many of their hotline specialists will go so far as to type those out in these boxes here for potential causes or confirmed fixes, whichever it might be. If they don't do that and they literally just type in something generic like taillight bulb or whatever it might be, it's possible that, that when they click on that, the search may come up empty and you're going to go, hey, wait a minute, what do you mean there's nothing? Well, that doesn't necessarily mean there's nothing. It just means that the search engine didn't find it because whatever terminology was used right here maybe didn't match up with what the vehicle manufacturer was calling it. So again, just another detail to keep in mind that can really screw you up that unfortunately it's a pitfall of their website. Now, as they continue to overhaul the website, I know they're trying to make this better. Uh, but again, as all corporate things are, takes a long time. <laughs> Can't expect it to happen as fast as we might like. So uh, just another detail that's important to keep uh, kind of at the forefront of your mind. So now we've looked over the hotline archives. That's essentially the meat of the website. One of the things I like to go over with folks is fuses or relays, things of that nature, um, because that's a really common one that can vary across vehicle manufacturer. And it can be really beneficial to kind of go in and poke around and see where that might be located uh, given on a specific vehicle manufacturer. So like for Hyundai, if we go to the service manual, usually where I go for any fuser relay stuff, I start right at the ETM. The ETM, electronic troubleshooting manual, wiring manual, whatever it might be called, that's almost always where I'm going to start. Now, with Hyundai, you have the unique benefit of if you just simply go into a wiring diagram, like if we went back to the stop lamps diagram, we might be able to just access the fuse box if it was highlighted. Now, in this particular case, it is not highlighted, so we do not have the ability to click on it. But many of the vehicle manufacturers will make this interactive, and then you can just click on it, and it will take you to a picture of the fuse block. So instead, we'll go to something like power distribution. Now, a lot of vehicle manufacturers like to do stuff like they'll make the first diagram in the sequence actually the, the picture of the fuse block or whatever it might be called, power distribution center, whatever. Uh, now, Hyundai also has these little icons up at the top, right? So you can basically just jump to the next page without having to actually exit and continue. But in this situation, you can see we can just kind of page through and look at all the diagrams and whatnot. Now, Hyundai doesn't show it there. So we didn't see it in power distribution. Here we go. Passenger compartment fuse details. Let's see if they show it there. And again... They don't. So there's nothing. So let's say we want to look it up and figure out what it might be. Let's try. We could look under component locations. It's very possible that it'll show us. Well, actually, let's let's be even lazier. Let's use the search box. Well, I like to poke around and just kind of use my logical brain to figure out, okay, where might it be? Let's see if this helps us. There we go. Shows the ID of all the relays. Now here they're not showing a squat for fuses, but they are showing us all of the relays. So that's nice. So now we see where that's located under body electrical. So you can actually see the, the flow of where they're physically showing us it's located within the manual. So we could actually go and dig it out then and figure out, okay, where do you have all the other stuff? So here's some more description and operation mumbo jumbo and things of that nature. So again, we can see it's going to be variable depending on the vehicle manufacturer. Sometimes it's going to be something where they go, hey, look, it's really easy to find. Other times it's not. And there we go. So sometimes you have to click on a couple of different documents before you'll get the one that you want. And that's kind of where the search box is a little bit, you know, it's not as it's not a scalpel. It's a broadsword. So you do have to be patient and you do have to do a, a little more clicking but typically speaking, if you use your brain, you'll find what you're looking for. And here we go. This is a great example. They give us all the layouts. They have everything labeled. It's actually pretty helpful. But again, varies by vehicle manufacturer. So we'll go just for another demo vehicle. We'll go to a VW or, an, well, yeah, let's do a VW. We'll say like a 2010 Jetta. Should be a pretty straightforward one that I would expect they'll have the information here. All right, so we'll select that. So now in Volkswagen land, you'll see there's a bunch of different manuals on this one. So we're going to go under service manuals in the top black bar. And of course, we can see there's multiple vehicle manuals loaded for this vehicle. So if it's a wagon, you can see it's the AJ5 chassis. 
if it is the repair uh, this particular generation, it's the 1K2. So again, it's going to vary by whatever it might be. Now, usually you can find this out with the VIN, but I will say there's a number of resources that can be very helpful for narrowing down VIN specific characteristics, things like which chassis it is or you know which production code it has. Uh, if you are doing European vehicles, I would highly recommend that you bookmark the link and I will put it here in chat box. Parts link 24, super duper duper helpful. Absolutely tremendous. Uh, they, it does VIN decoding for Volkswagen, Audi, BMW, Land Rover, Jaguar, uh, and at least a couple other European vehicles. Volvo, I know for sure. Um, don't know if it does Mercedes, but it's really helpful because, again, it's going to help you narrow down a ton of stuff. Uh, being able to actually do, like, you know, see a lot of details about the vehicle, how many amps the alternator is. Uh, what production codes it has, you know, does it have this level of equipment or this level of equipment? The other site that I strongly recommend, RepairLink. Those are the two. Uh, RepairLink also has a feature. That's a free site, RepairLink. Uh, that one has the capabilities. It's really good for RPO codes for GM. Uh, you put in the VIN, basically. It actually allows you to see OEM parts and things of that nature. But the benefit of RepairLink is you can see additional VIN details that you would otherwise not have any way to decode or verify. Uh, I actually just stumbled across a Toyota one the other day, which I think I shared in a couple of the groups, but uh, I'll definitely share it again here. Um, that actually does the same thing. Tells you vehicle equipment, gives you more details on, hey, this is what equipment it has, which radio version, whatever. All the details that you usually need to do a diagnosis of something. Um, so both uh, PartsLink24 is pretty inexpensive. Uh, on the last session, Cody said, I believe it was something like 20 or 30 bucks a month. So if you work on Euro vehicles with any regularity, totally get it. It's indispensable. There's also some really great benefits of having pictures of where stuff is located. So that's another really good thing to both with RepairLink and PartsLink is you can get access to some additional diagrams or pictures of where stuff is located, um, which, you know, sometimes the manual is lacking. So you might be looking at the manual going, holy crap, I can't tell where that is. Uh, actually, great example. I was just helping a gentleman the other day on a Toyota. He was trying to figure out where the gateway module was on this Corolla. And the service manual was like not really helping very much. And so I said, all right, well, pull up repair link and look it up and or, you know, call the dealer and ask them to tell you what the part number is for that man, that module. And so he did. And then he found the picture and the dealer faxed him a picture of where it's located. And it confirmed that it was in the same area by the HVAC box in the glove box. And he did some digging around, whatever. And then he finally found the module. And of course, the part number on the module mas matched what the dealer was like. Oh, yeah. And it's labeled gateway. I found it now. So again, using all of those resources to answer questions that sometimes the service information just kind of falls short on. Um, you know, it's, it's so tough to do this job as a tech, you know, being back out in the field after being in Identifix where, you know, we're kind of, you're kind of spoiled. You're sitting there. All you have to do is use a computer and talk to people on the phone. And it's kind of simple compared to you go back out in the field, you work on a vehicle directly. You see all the challenges that the shops really face on a daily basis. So there's anytime we can get additional resources to make jobs easier on ourselves. You know, we want to take advantage of those because ultimately fixing cars is not an easy job. And you need every single asset you can possibly get access to to make your life easier. So those two sites, tremendously valuable. And I cannot stress enough just how good they are. Uh, there is one more, which is also a free site, uh, Real OEM. That's for BMW. Uh, really beneficial there to help you with build dates, engine, all of that stuff, especially if you're less familiar with those brands, uh, uh, specifically Mini Cooper or BMW. And actually, technically now, Rolls-Royce. <laughs> so... Yeah, I think both all those resources are really tremendous and can make your life a lot easier. Um, are there any specific brands that you guys struggle with or have questions on that you're like trying to find something specific, whether it's fuse and relay information or R and R stuff or whatever it might be? Anything that you guys really want to know that you want to cover more in depth? Another any demo vehicle or a vehicle maybe you're working on recently, whatever it might be. Feel free to sound off in the chat. You know, just type it in. And uh, we'll try to try to go through a couple of things if you got something specific or if you just have general questions, you know, I'm happy to help if I can there, too.
So network information, you talking about like uh, CAN bus, LIN bus, things like that? Ah, gotcha. Okay. So that's a good example. Definitely another one that I think people frequently have questions of. Uh, so this one, <laughs> Volkswagen's probably the worst one to do it on. Uh, we'll, we'll be lazy. We'll go back to the Hyundai to start with. <laughs> uh, again, this is going to be, you know, typically speaking, I'm going to go right into the wiring manual for the OEM for something like that. Uh, again, it varies on vehicle manufacturer, what they're going to give you, what they're not, uh, depending on what they'll do. So sometimes vehicle manufacturers are going to give you something pretty generic. Sometimes they're going to give you something really specific. Like some manufacturers might not give you an overall bus wiring diagram because they're dicks. Uh, other ones, they'll give you a bus wiring diagram that shows you all the modules. So usually what I like to do is a control F on the keyboard and then use like a hot word like bus or network, nothing. So we got absolutely nothing. It didn't highlight a single thing. So now we're going to go here and I'm just going to type in network. And now remember, I went into the service manuals in the top here and I clicked on that. So we're only searching through the vehicle manufacturer's information. So we're going to scroll down here. We're going to see what we got. See if we have any information that's going to help us out. You can notice there's the show all button here. So we want to look there and look at. Sometimes I'll just go to a, a fault code to see if the fault code is going to give us something because a lot of the time they will actually link to exactly what we're looking for. Now, in this case, they don't. But like General Motors, for instance, will link you to a schematic for a given system if you're trying to diagnose that system. So here, we came up with absolutely nothing related to that. We did not get a wiring diagram. We came up completely empty. So now I'm going to search data bus. See if we get anything that way. Communication bus. All right. So we're getting closer. So ah, here we go. So it looks like Hyundai is most likely going to be giant jer jerks. They're going to be telling us, oh, look, you have to look through individual wiring diagrams. So we're going to look here and see what we got here. There's Lin bus right there. Let's see what else we get from the other diagrams that came up here. MFI control system. There's a, that's kind of an overall wiring diagram of the ECM there, which is nice. Oxygen sensors. So again, we have to like page through and look through each individual diagram. So it looks like we're not going to get a shortcut that's actually going to take us to, hey, we want blank. So we searched data bus, came up empty. Can also try. And... Now, they might also give us a description in operation. In fact, I think actually on the last diagram, we might have had that. Let's see what we got here for our wiring diagrams this time. Remember to always hit this see all button, or sometimes if you have even more, uh, you'll have stuff like that. Here's one of the data link. So DLC is likely going to tell us some stuff here. So here's DLC, CCAN right there. I bet if we page through these, we might find some more data. There we go. Look at that. So you can see we had to do some poking around to kind of figure it out. So a data link connector or DLC is probably a good thing to search as well. That'd be another good key term. But look, we were able to kind of poke our way around and figure out where it was located. Now, was it right out of the gate? I might have missed it. It might have been labeled in the uh, service manual. So if I click on that again, go right back to the main table of contents, click on that. Let's see if it's in there. Yep, sure is. I'm just blind. So there we go. So that's just another one of those, hey, you just got to figure out what the hell specific terminology they're using to identify the given component you actually want to find. Which, you know, hey, idiotic that you have to monkey around like that. But of course, you know, if you poke around enough and use your technician specific experience and knowledge, you'll definitely be able to find what you're looking for. It just there's definitely some arm twisting and things of that nature that you run into sometimes just trying to trying to di dial it in and figure it out. So let's go. We'll do another vehicle here. Let's do a Honda. Honda's a good one. We'll do 
because they have really awesome interactive manuals as well. Now, the one thing I didn't mention before that is really crucial to keep in mind that you'll find uh, on Honda and actually on a number of vehicle manufacturers is which web browser you're using. Uh, the web browsers are not all completely compatible when, excuse me, when you are viewing service manual content. I'm currently using Firefox and as of right now, Firefox seems to be the best one. However, as you know, with web browsers, Chrome, Edge, and uh, Firefox all get updated very regularly. And every time they update them, they change something. And of course, that seems to affect the functionality of how the manual works on your computer. Now, the reason for this being is the service manual content that is on the website is presented in the same format that it comes off of the vehicle manufacturer's website. So Identifix literally just uploads it exactly as it is. All data actually doesn't have interactive diagrams usually because they turn everything into a PNG or picture file, uh, which is why their website works really good on phones and things of that nature, but also lacks some of the interactivity that you can get through Identifix. Um, technically for Identifix, the only browser that is 100% compatible is Internet Explorer 11, which is ridiculous because that is as old and crappy of a browser as you can possibly have. However, uh, that is still factually the best browser for the website. Now, that being said, if you do have Internet Explorer 11 on your computer, you want to make sure you install Adobe Acrobat Reader and restart your computer after doing that. And then if you use Internet Explorer 11, you will be able to access all of the content and none of it should have any functionality issues. Um, so we might run into a functionality issue on this Honda. should be interesting to find out. So click on service manuals at that top there. And you can see here, look, Honda calls it an electronic troubleshooting manual too. So it might be something to do with Asia. Maybe they just all like that terminology. Now, Honda, you can see here, look at, it's all boxes we can click on. Oh, look, ISIS. That's really good, right? <laughs> uh, but we can click on stuff. And if it's working correctly, which lo and behold, it is. The last time I used Firefox, it didn't. So it actually takes you to like a cool table of contents and you can see these like arrows. Now look, the arrow doesn't work. See if this arrow works. Nope. So we can't get to that, but I bet we can get to this. So some of the links look like they're working. Some of them do not. You can click on the circuit index and maybe go back here, see if it'll take us to the page. There we go. So there you go, you can still see the fuse and relay box and whatnot there. But as we can see, some of the functionality is not completely functioning the way we would like, which kind of sucks. But, you know, only so much you can do there. Here, look, here's all the bus data right here. Honda actually gives you like a ton of diagrams that you can click on, which is kind of cool. Helpful. And of course, remembering, you know, hey, if we got a, a diagram we want to bookmark, do that. And also keep in mind that you want to be able to use these buttons to go back and forth, like up here and things of that nature. So uh, as you can see, you know, more interactive content available again, uh, highly dependent on which web browser you're using, whether or not it's going to actually work when you click on it. Um, but if all else fails, switch to Internet Explorer 11, and then you'll be able to access every link and all of the buttons will work. Uh, Although it does appear that most of them are working on Firefox currently. So that's kind of awesome. Uh, good news on that front, I guess. Any other vehicles that you got that, uh, yeah, yep, multiplex. That's another good word for uh, communication. So I think that's that really highlights the kind of the, the key that you want to keep in mind as a technician is remember all the different words. You know, think about all the different things it could be labeled as or termed as. Um, it can really, really, really help you uh, as far as that goes. Oh, yeah. Good, good point. So IE 11 is actually, I think, maybe not even natively supported on uh, Windows 10. They might not even be including it with Windows 10 anymore, but you can still get it. Uh, you can seek it out on the internet and usually download it. Yeah, there you go. Yes, there you go. There's uh, textbook glossaries. If you have any kind of automotive specific ones like that, uh, the Bosch automotive book, uh, I forget what the hell it's called. It's like the Bosch automotive Bible things of that nature, anything like that. It can help you a lot with those word equivalencies and things like that that'll really help you search out and find what you're looking for on the website. Uh, again, they do their best to try and make the search engine work, but again, it's a it's a broadsword, not a razor. 
So we're getting close. We're getting better, you know, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, unfortunately many things have not gotten better even since I left over a year ago. And, uh, you know, that's, that just illustrates how slow the process is for uh, improvement and change, unfortunately. But if you ever worked at a large corporate organization, you know that that is absolutely not surprising. Annoying and frustrating, absolutely. But uh, exceptional or out of the ordinary, definitely not. So um, <laughs> uh, any other stuff you guys want to cover? Any questions about anything? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Solera was definitely a huge linchpin for screwing up a lot of stuff at Identifix. And, you know, if you guys are interested in more of the backstory and whatnot, you know, feel free to message me after this. Uh, I can tell you a lot more, just my own personal insight as to what's happened and whatnot. Um, I do have a lot more intimate details that I won't share on here, but just interesting stuff, you know, about how things have gone down and whatnot. So again, Identifix, good resource, a lot of stuff you're not going to find anywhere else. Um, when used properly, a good resource. And again, I think really at the end of the day, as a, if you're in the aftermarket and you don't work on just a handful of brands, you really got to have two information sources. You know, you got to have Identifix because they've got stuff that Mitchell and all data don't have. And you got to have preferably, I would say, all data over Mitchell because all data has stuff that the other two don't have. Now, I will say one thing that Mitchell does have that the other two don't is sometimes they have old TSBs that I have not been able to locate literally anywhere except on Mitchell. Um, I don't know why that is. I've never figured out quite why. I do know that with, at least with Identifix, they do what is called a content refresh on a periodic basis. So essentially, if you, let's say you select a 2012 Volkswagen Jetta and you go into Irwin, which is the factory repair information website for the aftermarket. If you query that vehicle on Irwin, you'll get a certain number of documents back, including TSBs, service information, et cetera. That information gets refreshed by the OEM when they add or take away TSBs. And they do do that. A lot of guys don't know, but they delete and erase TSBs after a certain period of time. Sometimes they also do it. Hypothetically, a lot of people think to cover their ass to prevent lawsuits, which is, I think, why GM doesn't like it when PITs and PIPs get put on websites and whatnot, because I think they're concerned they're going to get smoked and have to maybe do extended coverage. But anyhow, um, with Mitchell, they have a lot of old archives. I actually ran into some uh, TSBs that were archived on Mitchell on Mercedes Benz that one of my colleagues, when I worked at Identifix, he was the Mercedes guy. He said, you know, hey, I know there's these TSBs on these vehicles that exist. They're no longer in Mercedes Star. We went on there, nothing. It's not in the tips. It's not anywhere in Mercedes. They're just missing. But if we Google it, we type in, hey, the vehicle and the code or the vehicle and the, you know, fault, whatever description. Sure enough, you'd find it would come up in a search and it would show it on Mitchell. And Mitchell still had the TSB somehow. No idea how, no idea why. I think Mitchell keeps their stuff static. They add, but I don't think they delete or refresh in the same capacity that all data or Identifix do. So once again, just another illustration that having one information resource is never enough, uh, without a doubt. So as much as I'll advocate and say, hey, I like Identifix, I think it's a good tool, it is absolutely not the only tool you should have. Uh, if you have no other choice, uh, fine. Uh, otherwise, no, nah, I would really strongly recommend having at least two. Um, and I think it also is helpful network, you know, make, make friends with people who have the stuff you don't have and share with each other. You know, if you've got Identifix and your friend doesn't, maybe he has all data and you have Identifix. Okay. If you run across a vehicle where the information is missing on Identifix, call your buddy, say, Hey, can you send me the wiring diagram on this? Whatever it might be. Um, you can always request it through the website. But depending on how busy they are, that could take you 24 hours. Yeah, right. <laughs> so that's, that's, I think that's one of the things you got to remember. So, um, but, you know, networking can't be highlighted enough for, for making your life easier. But uh, if you guys don't have any other questions uh, or you want to talk about anything else related to this or, you know, any other automotive related stuff, we can shoot BS, whatever, for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, nobody's talking. Yeah, that's well, that's that's not all bad, right? <laughs> but the good news is it is uh it is recorded. 
So, you know, if they had to step away or whatnot, totally no problem. We're going to have a recording for this. So I'm going to go ahead and post it up and share it on the website via my Google Drive. And, uh, you know, if there's anything else that you have questions or you come up with related to the program, please don't hesitate. You can message me on Facebook and I'll try to help you if I can, for sure. I don't mind helping. I know, like I said, the job's not easy. I know there's infinite headaches you face on a daily basis. So always, uh, always glad to help and make it easier if I can. It's, uh, you know, that the, the trouble that we face is never any, any shorter. <laughs> the list only gets longer on a daily basis. So cool. Well, good deal. Uh, you know, if you guys take the survey, which, uh, all the way up, if you scroll in the chat, there is a survey I posted up there. If you want to take that and, you know, just, uh, vote on any kind of stuff that you might like to see training on. Um, that's helpful. Uh, I do plan to do some more free training type of stuff like this on uh, subjects that people are interested in, try to get as much uh, attendance as possible. Um, you know, I'm no, I don't know everything and I definitely don't know everything about even one thing, but uh, I have a tremendous network of people that I'm friends with, knowledgeable people that I can uh, collaborate with to create some quality content. And uh, I love doing it. I think it's very beneficial to spend some time doing this type of stuff. And, uh, you know, any way I can help people do better and succeed more is uh, something I'd like to like to do. So uh, if you guys are all good and you don't have any other questions, uh, I will most definitely. I did not record the first day. I wish I did. I totally did not. Uh, but uh, if. Uh, oh, here, I'll paste the link for the survey one more time here. Whoops. <laughs> Should be able to. There you go. There's the survey link. So yeah, if you guys have uh, any other questions that come up or whatnot, let me know. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and I'll stop the recording here. Hit the whoops. That's not what I meant to hit. <laughs> Got to hit the little button on the right here. Stop recording. There we go.